industry leaders in cybersecurity. If you're fake, people know you fake. Describing the behavior of the most sophisticated actors in the space, it was considered to be not worth your time. Do it because you love it. Any computer problem was to wipe and reinstall your stuff. Like I got to dive into the mindset. How beneficial this tool is, how impactful. To get access to all this mind share. That's the creative process, the process of trying. Welcome to Hack Chat. My name is Marco Figaro, and today we have a guest that I'm pretty sure you've watched her talks at Black Hat, maybe Kaspersky SAS, DEF CON, or you may have come across her TED talk on Stalkware that has over 2.4 million views. Eva, on Twitter, she goes by Eva Side. Eva is the EFF's Director of Cybersecurity. I first met her at SAS in 2018, and I believe she was talking about uh, the dark caracal. Mm -hmm. I was impressed with her command of the stage. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go and watch that TED talk. The way she presents, the way she has the command with her words and how she expresses herself. It is, I, I, I watch all of her talks, Eva, Welcome to Hack Chat. Can you give the listeners a background on yourself? Sure, no problem. Uh, hi, my name is Eva Galperin. I'm the Director of Cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, I'm basically a security person who had uh, dreams of becoming a lawyer and then was kidnapped by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, <laughs> turned into an activist, and eventually uh, got my own team, uh, which we call Threat Lab. Uh, Threat Lab works on uh, sort of security research for good, uh, sort of uh, impact security research. We do research on uh, on APTs, on computer issues, on uh, the particularly on the needs of uh, vulnerable populations, and that can be anybody from journalists to activists to lawyers to victims of uh, of domestic abuse. And uh, I've spent the last few years uh, specifically working on the domestic abuse use case. Uh, so I've been particularly interested in that and doing a lot of work there. Uh, I helped found the Coalition Against Stalkerware, uh, which uh, contains, I think, something like 30 different organizations right now. We're very excited about it. Um, and uh, I'm happy to be here today. Wow, thank you. How did you break into the industry? Well, uh, I I broke into the industry in in the nineties when it was really easy. Uh, basically, if you could fall out of bed and had a general idea of like how a Cisco router works and could use a you know Unix command line uh, and you know, install Solaris, uh, you could get a job. It, it was really really easy. And I originally uh, started working as a systems administrator. Uh, back when everything was a systems administrator, and uh, I, I worked in uh, you know, doing Unix stuff and networking stuff and Windows stuff and spent a lot of time struggling with NT. Uh, and a lot of what I did um, was, it didn't require like a degree in computer science or a bunch of certificates or anything like that because the degrees in computer science weren't actually teaching people how to do this just yet. And uh, the certificates simply didn't exist. <laughs> I, I read, they let a feral 17 year old into their company. Yeah, I read somewhere that um, your dad went ahead and built your first machine when you were 11 or 12. I yeah. think it was. What was that? Was he in the industry as well? Yes. Uh, my dad worked for Sun Microsystems. Oh. And uh, the, the first way that I got onto the internet was by dialing up with a 2400 baud modem with like one of those little wise green screen terminals that yep. you uh, they used to see in libraries. And uh, when my father wanted to ground me because grounding a nerd is pointless, uh, <laughs> he would comment out my account. Ooh, wow. I wanna read, I wanna go into it and I wanna read a tweet that you wrote uh, maybe, you know, a few weeks ago. You wrote, you don't need permission to become a security researcher. Occasionally, you need forgiveness, but not permission. Can you go in depth for the people that are in security that might not think they are security researchers? Because I loved it. Fantastic. Well, uh, this was sort of the basis of the keynote that I just gave at CactusCon 
a few weeks ago. And uh, Cactus Con is a sort of, you know, kind of a uh, hacker conference of the old school uh, in as much as these things are possible right now because it's not a you know, physical in-person conference. But much like DEF CON, it happened entirely on Discord. It had a theme, which was the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. There were a lot of, uh, there were, you know, a lot of people who were listening. And it came from sort of the, the more uh, ragged, not necessarily professional end of the market. And one of the things that I've really seen change in, uh, in the area of security research, and for that matter in IT and in information security, is uh, a lot of gatekeeping. Um, it used to be that you could roll out of bed and if you had these three skills, you could get yourself a job. And that's simply not the case anymore. Uh, now there are a lot of people who are asking for you know, degrees from top tier universities and a variety of certs. And often the people who are asking for these things are the people who got their fee in the door with no qualifications whatsoever because the <laughs> qualifications didn't exist yet. Yeah. Like I don't have a degree in computer science. I started a degree in computer science and then I, uh, I dropped out of it because I was busy with my computer science job. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was fairly typical of what people were doing like in the late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just heard talking about conferences, uh, virus bulletin is going, ahead and, and planning a conference for in person. It's the first conference security conference that I've heard that they're they're planning on doing it this I think in the upcoming months. So I was just uh, having a text message back and forth with uh, people about submitting to it just so we can get out of our house and travel, you know, so I'm looking forward to that. I hope I hope mm -hmm. it comes, you know, we could finally meet up. I, I think for me, I think 2021 is going to be that time where everyone starts going back to uh, conferences. And, you know, I, I definitely miss going to conferences, having, you know, meeting up with like minded individuals. That's that's something that I really missed. And I do miss traveling. I miss my travel miles, you know, for for airplanes. But you I know, don't miss not being jet lagged all the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the conferences are really important because they're that place where you do the hallway track. Uh, oh, yeah. Where, where you coincidentally just run into people and you come up with projects you're going to work on. Or, hey, I know the right person for this particular job. Or, you know, why don't we start, you know, this particular initiative? Uh, a lot of that happens at conferences. And I feel like we're, we've lost a, a significant portion of that over the last year while we're all stuck inside our apartments. Yeah, absolutely. What led you... Um you to start researching uh, APTs and, and writing reports? Well, uh, I started out uh, researching internet censorship. My, uh, my undergraduate work uh, was uh, very, very focused on Chinese internet censorship mm -hmm. um, because at the time it was the only internet censorship in town. And there was this thought that like, oh, look, it's so quaint. It's a country trying to keep its you know, entire internet under control. Surely no one else will do this. And also look at all these ways in which it doesn't work. So ha ha, eventually it will crumble and uh, democracy and free speech will reign supreme. Uh, boy, were we extremely wrong about everything. So uh, when I came to work at EFF and I moved to the sort of uh, international activism team, we were starting to see um, a lot of, uh, of internet censorship. And then the sort of next thing that I, uh, we were starting to see internet censorship in the Middle East, uh, for example, um, the, it, in Syria, you couldn't get on Facebook. And uh, it, you know, throughout uh, all of North Africa and the Middle East, there were a lot of countries that were that were blocking access. Um, but what we started to see were these countries allowing access again, and then trying to man in the middle the traffic, mm. so that they could get all kinds of interesting information about what uh, opponents of the of the ruling party were doing. And uh, this happened in Syria in about 2011, uh, before the civil war, but you know, sort of in the lead up to the civil war. And at the time, uh, so Syria was run by Bashir al-Assad and the, the popular notions about Bash Bashir al-Assad was he, he used to paint himself as the father of the Syrian internet. 
he was this sort of westernized guy who had been, you know, educated in the West, and he was going to drag Syria into the into the 21st century. Again, have we been over how wrong that was? It was extremely wrong. We were wrong in every way. Um, Bashir al-Assad and his wife got like some sort of mad, you know, uh, you know, Annie Leibovitz photographed spread in Harper's. Like that, that is how much the uh, the U.S. media was fawning over them. Uh, and as it turns out, super wrong. Um, so what they were doing was uh, they were they were spying on traffic to Facebook. They they essentially uh, stopped censoring Facebook so that they could spy on it and see how people were opposing them. Uh, and then when uh, when Facebook started moving over to HTTPS only traffic in places like Syria and Tunisia before HTTPS only traffic was the was the standard uh, so long ago when the web was <laughs> unencrypted. Uh, then we started seeing things like the Jijinotar attack. We started seeing uh, countries uh, sort of faking SSL certificates in order to man in the middle traffic. Uh, so I started there and then we started seeing that uh, Syrian dissidents were being targeted by uh, by malware and not even particularly complicated malware, like super straight up awkward malware of the sort that uh, that you and I would have been embarrassed to send forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't getting a lot of coverage in uh, in the security industry because the quality of the malware was so low. Um, at the time, it was fashionable to cover sort of your you know five eyes, mm -hmm. uh, Russia, China, maybe North Korea. Uh, definitely Israel. Um, but if you weren't um, describing the behavior of the most sophisticated actors in the space, it was considered to be not worth your time. Uh, because other people who were, uh, who were doing this sort of work, the other security researchers were like, well, what kind of flex is that, that you found some, <laughs> you know, malware written in Delphi. Um, mm -hmm. But it turns out that it had tremendous political implications. And it definitely had an effect on the lives of people who opposed the Assad administration in the sense that the security, um, the security forces would come to their house and take them to uh, places where they would then be tortured uh, and, and often killed. So this was one of those places where a little bit of work is sort of tilted in the right direction could make a really big difference. Uh, and from there, I spread out into, you know, uh, me, uh, to uh, APTs that were working for Kazakhstan, APTs that were working for Lebanon, APTs that were working for uh, Vietnam, uh, the APT that would later be named Ocean Lotus. Uh, and I did a bunch of reports on that. Can you give me a time when you researched or you were working on, on a case with APT that you, you know, you were surprised that you was like, oh, this is interesting. What well, this is, I, I got to dive deeper and, and figure out more things. And I'm not going to go to sleep for like three days. Oh, all the time. <laughs> uh, I, uh, there was, there was a, a particular moment in Dark Caracal when um, essentially uh, my, uh, my colleague Cooper Quinton and I had encountered this particular APT before. And we got a call from, uh, from Lookout essentially saying, hey, we're seeing this APT again. Here are the CNCs, here are some samples. Uh, we do mobile analysis. Do you guys want to do the Windows analysis? That kind of thing. So we were, we were looking through this, uh, this APT's behavior. And the previous time when we had uh, written a report on them, they had left uh, all their directories open. And so we had pulled all the data down from their CNCs. And uh, this time we thought, oh, surely, surely they're too smart to do this. So we didn't even like run Durbuster. Uh, we, were, we were just like, well, you know, we'll write up a quick report saying that, uh, that this particular actor is up to their old tricks again. Mm -hmm. And uh, we think they may be targeting these people and it looks like this. And we were halfway through writing the report when my colleague uh, Cooper said, ah, what the hell? I'll run Durbuster. Surely they cannot have made the same mistake twice. Mm. And about half a terabyte of data later, <laughs> we realized we had a much longer report. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Uh, shout out to Cooper. Love you. Oh, yeah. 
you know, I, I there's so many uh, cool stories. I, I I have to bring him on as well. Oh, absolutely. You know, he he's amazing. Fantastic. Yeah. Why is cybersecurity researchers and, and just cybersecurity in general so infatuated with attribution? And do you think it hinders like the investigation if, you know, if someone calls out China or, or Russia? It depends. I think in the case of stuff like, you know, Chinese and, and Russian APTs, it's good to understand what, you know, what these APTs are doing. Uh, some level of attribution is important because it helps you to understand uh, what they're looking for, mm -hmm. because the stuff that the Chinese government is, is looking for is different from what, you know, the uh, FSB is looking for. Uh, and you can protect yourself accordingly. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, attribution is important. Uh, and believe me, I love myself some, you know, hyper solid attribution. One of my favorite things about Dark Caracol was when we uh, when we managed to track the uh, the administrator down to the floor he worked on in the building where he worked in Beirut. Uh, you know, uh, is that out? Did they put that out? Is it out on YouTube? Your talk? The first? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah you, you guys have to watch it. It was awesome. I was in person and I was like, oh, wow, this is Much amazing. Fun oh, yeah, it was it was very entertaining and I'm happy it's it's out there. What do you think of solar winds? Of what? Oh, so, of solar winds? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the sort of general trend yeah, of the, uh, the timeline. And, you know, I think that is a conversation within itself. And I want to I don't want to dig too deep, you know, mm -hmm. but what, what are your thoughts? What? You know what's been going on to me it's the hack the breach that keeps on giving oh yeah i have been really interested in following uh sort of what comes out of solar winds uh the u.s government or at least the fbi seems extremely confident about its attribution uh but they haven't brought out a whole lot in the way of showing their work uh, and so i am at least a little bit skeptical in in that area but having done uh you know having said that uh, yes, Russia absolutely has an interest in doing uh, supply chain attacks. They have historically been very patient and they have historically been willing to be, uh, you know, sort of very long term players in the game. Uh, they're not the only long term players in the game. So yeah. that doesn't necessarily uh, rule out things like, you know, Israel or indeed the United States. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you really want to see some supply chain attacks. Definitely. U.S. is the place to go. Um, I, for, but yeah, I, I think that it's it's a really hard thing to protect against. And uh, if you are spending your time doing, you know, if you're a CISO and your job is to do risk management, this is a um, this is an attacker that's very very difficult to protect yourself against. Uh, and in some cases, uh, all that a CISO can do is come up with a way to cover their ass. <laughs> I bet, I bet. I mean, most of what CISOs do. I mean, the the threat actors, you know, after going after FireEye, you know, they must have said, hey, if we go after these, uh, this firm, we're probably going to get caught, right? And I, I was like, they were playing with house's money at that that point. They're like, let's go after everything. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think it's the hack that We'll keep on giving, mm -hmm. as you see, you know, for the first, I believe, month of 2021, every single week in January, there was a report or two reports on, on things coming out. And it's just interesting how all of this uh, is going to play out in the future. Yeah. This is totally not going to be the the last uh, solar that we hear of solar winds. Oh, no. Uh, we, we are going to be seeing a lot more reports from companies that uh, turn out to have been compromised and turn out to have been compromised for really extended periods of time because solar winds as an actor is very good at staying silent. Oh, yeah. Waiting. Can you take me through a day in the life of a security researcher? It depends. Uh, my, my days are often very different from one another. I am that uh, recently, my tweet about uh, helping women who had been sexually assaulted by hackers uh, get you know some some help um, looking at their uh, at their devices uh, has been making the rounds again. So I have about five mm. or six domestic abuse uh, issues in in my inbox every morning. 
Um, so the so the first thing that I do is I talk to five or six people about the worst thing that has ever happened to them. Mm. Uh, and then I go and have several coffees and uh, look at pictures of puppies and unicorns. Uh, and, <laughs> and then I can get on with the rest of my day. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, frequently I am uh, am talking to journalists and activists. I I give a lot of talks. I work with uh, with coalitions to facilitate information sharing between uh, between security companies and also between the people who are likely to be targeted by you know these sort of state actors. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also talk to companies. Uh, yeah. One of the the things that I do that is related to security research, but that I think like doesn't get enough love, uh, is I go to companies and I talk to them about use cases they haven't thought of before, mm. uh, that they should uh, you know, think about when it comes to their products. Uh, for example, uh, it turns out that uh, Clubhouse uh, asks to, to notify all of your list of contacts that you have joined Clubhouse. Uh, which mm. is not great. You also cannot block anyone on Clubhouse because uh, it just doesn't have any blocking features. So if, uh, if someone you really hate or uh, your abuser or your ex is on Clubhouse, you cannot stop them from talking to you. Wow. Have you always been interested in privacy? Oh, yes, absolutely. I cannot remember a time that I didn't care about privacy or security. Uh, and, you know, uh, probably there was a time I was, you know, probably very interested in science fiction novels, but, uh, but after that privacy and security, uh, and, and part of that was just, uh, I, I was born in the Soviet union and, uh, my family and I emigrated from there, uh, when I was a kid and I grew up hearing all the time about this sort of fleeing from authoritarianism from this place where there was no privacy. Mm-hmm. And privacy was one of the values that was really held highest in my family. Uh, so that's, that's why I went into it. I love totally this story. I love this story um, that I, I can't recall where I heard it from, but I know I think it was in Glamour. I think it was in Glamour when you were talking about how your mother was talking about privacy when the Walkman, something about the Walkman. And, and yes, can you go he into that? I love that. All right. So my mother had this theory about how uh, the how the Walkman uh, destroyed the Soviet Union, uh, which was that uh, the Walkman allowed people uh, a certain level of privacy in what they were listening to. And so you could actually uh, share ideas and you could share, you know, kind of uh, meme material. Uh, that you wouldn't want other people to hear you uh, listening to and therefore report about uh, with a certain level of privacy. And once you had a place outside of your head where you could share information and it wouldn't go directly to the state, uh, it did a lot to undermine authoritarianism. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to go into what you were saying about the um, tweet that went viral, um, that it's coming back around. I'm, I'm, I want to say it was some sort of thing like this women who has been sexually abused by a hacker contact me, right. Which became a project. Can you go into that? Like when you tweeted that and the story behind that? Sure. Uh, so when I was working on APTs, I was, uh, I was working with another security researcher and, uh, he turned out to be a serial rapist. Uh, and there were a series of articles that were interviews with his, uh, with, with the people who had survived his abuse. And one of the interviews, which was, I think, in, uh, in Vice or The Verge, I can't even remember where the interview was now, it's so embarrassing, but uh, the, there was an interview with his uh, with the survivors in, uh, in New Zealand. And it had a tremendous emphasis on how scared they all were. And what they were particularly frightened about was that this guy would compromise their devices because apparently he had threatened to do so. And Mm -hmm. uh, he spent a lot of time telling everybody what elite hacker he was. Um, So I got very angry and I tweeted that anybody who had this particular problem could come to me and I would make sure that their device got a full forensic analysis. Uh, I think it got retweeted more than 10,000 times and I... it still makes the rounds on Tumblr and on Facebook, and it led me to start the coalition against stalkerware and uh, TED Talk with two point something million views. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
I've, I've had uh, publishers approach me asking me if I want to write a book about this. And the answer is no, I'm too busy answering emails. Um, but <laughs> you know, you should I, take all of your emails and like uh -huh. make a book or something like that. so you can save time. How did you convince companies to buy into your idea of alerting on Stalkware? And how did you well, present it to them? Uh, shame. I did it through shame. Uh, I started with Kaspersky, which had had a really bad year. The year was 2018 <laughs> and Kaspersky had had a lot of exceptionally bad press because of uh, their own internal compromises and uh, a very strong uh, U.S. Uh, push uh, to blame everything on Russians and Russian propaganda. And so Kaspersky being uh, based in Russia suddenly became a, a very big deal. Uh, and uh, this became like a big danger to their business. So I knew that they needed a win. Uh, and that is why they were the first security company that I went to when I was looking for, uh, for an AV product that would take stalkerware seriously and that would specifically alert people uh, that they had stalkerware on their devices. And once one company did it, it was much easier for other companies to follow suit. And now it doesn't make that much of a difference which AV company you go with or which AV product you go uh, with uh, if you want to make sure that you can detect stalkerware on your device. That's nice. How many, are there a lot more companies, all companies or is it? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's yeah, there awesome. are a lot more companies that are doing this. There's a Git repo of uh, of IOCs. There is, uh, you know, a lot of information sharing uh, through the coalition against stalkerware. So we're working on it. Uh, nice. And uh, I expect that uh, this year's research into how well the AB companies are doing at detecting stalkerware uh, will be coming up soon. So I'm, I'm very excited about yeah, that. Yeah. So how you were talking about you started the coalition against uh, stock aware. How can people um, assist and help you? Maybe, you know, just their free time. Let's say on Saturdays and Sundays, I have a free time. And how can I help? Well, there's a bunch of stuff that you can do. Uh, good news. Uh, the um, A lot of people email me and they offer to help. And they think that what I really need is more people to do forensic analysis. And this is simply not the case. The uh, percentage of people who contact me who actually need a full forensic analysis for their devices is very low. Uh, most people need someone who will sit down and listen to them and help them lock down their devices and, uh, and accounts, uh, starting with an assumption of account compromise and then moving on to an assumption of, of device compromise. And you can't do this by being a security expert um, because if there's one thing that we suck at in InfoSec, it's dealing with non-InfoSec people in a trauma-informed way, especially non-InfoSec people who are having the worst day of their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, it is really common for people in information security to say things like, well, if you don't do that, you don't deserve security, you don't deserve privacy. Mm -hmm. And this is not the way that you treat somebody who's been having a really, really goddamn bad day. So what I recommend that people do is they start by doing a little bit of reading about trauma. Uh, I recommend uh, a book uh, called The Body Keeps the Score, uh, whose uh, author I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, and it is a book about the history of PTSD as a diagnosis. Uh, there is mm. also a book uh, called Why Does He Do That? Uh, which is a, a book about sort of um, abuse and, uh, and what it looks like in relationships. And uh, finally, I recommend a book called Helping Her Get Free, which is uh, specifically about how you support a, uh, an abuse survivor in getting out of their uh, abusive situation. So that's sort of like my, my quick reading list on what you want to do if you have the technical skills, but you really just need to build up the, the social skills that you need in order to do this sort of work. And I assure you that if you work in information security and you have a pulse and you know other human beings, you know somebody who's going through this yeah. and you can help. That's awesome. I, I, for me, I, I haven't met anyone like that that has told me, but I'm sure in my family or, you know, somewhere else that they're too ashamed to, to let that out, right? And I think we were talking about this before we started and one thing for me is like during this time of COVID, it's been so crazy and I've been meditating more and being in tune with myself. 
And one of one of the things I know is like I have I, I want to say PTSD if I hear a loud sound and mm -hmm. I had to reverse engineer. Why do I get like so afraid and shocked? Right. And it's because a trauma that happened with my mother that she fell, which has completely changed her life. Right. So when I hear loud bangs, I'm thinking it's something dealing with her. So mm -hmm. there's that trigger. Like if I'm outside, it's it's fine. But it's w when I'm in my house, when I'm working, I hear a loud sound and I immediately jump and go. But I don't think it, it for me, if if I wasn't in tune then and, and maybe COVID, I guess like just being quarantined for so long, you start trying to reverse engineer certain things. And, and I I'm, want to read that book that the first book you recommended. Mm -hmm. What is what is your next step to eradicate stalk war? Well, uh, I have a couple of different plans. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them is I'm helping out with some additional research into how the AV companies are doing, because I think it's really important to keep pressure on the AV companies. Uh, the other is I've uh, sort of branched out into uh, the ways in which female journalists are being harassed because they get uh, really singled out. Uh, and before anybody comes to me and tells me that men get stalked to and that men get spied on to and that they get bullied to uh, and, and abused, yes, absolutely. Um, out of the, uh, the people who come to me for help, I would say about two thirds are women and the other third are men. Uh, mm. And I have seen abusers take all kinds of forms, uh, you know, men, women, people in, you know, sort of uh, parental relationships, people in romantic relationships, people in same sex relationships. These, uh, I, I've seen every combination of, you know, sort of power dynamic that, uh, that you can imagine. Um, often, uh, when, when people are writing about this kind of trauma and writing about this kind of harassment, it's assumed that the victim is a woman and that the perpetrator mm -hmm. is a man. But the, the same advice applies no matter who it is. And everybody deserves help and everybody deserves uh, your sympathy and empathy. That's awesome. One thing I did not know about you is that you do aerial skill, skill silks workout. When did you start going and, and working out and doing the silk? Like I, I was seeing that in glamour. I was like, wow, that that's amazing. Like, does it clear your mind? Does it help you clear your mind? Oh, totally. Um, I, one of the things that I've really missed in this last year of COVID is that my circus school is closed. Mm. And so I couldn't go there to work out and I have to work out at home where I cannot hang a, uh, a silk because I live uh, in a Victorian apartment made of load bearing mold. Uh, there, there's simply nowhere to hang the damn thing. It would probably just collapse the whole place. Uh, and I really enjoyed doing aerial sulks for a long time. And I look forward to getting back to it. I just did a talk about this, uh, for, uh, Playfest, uh, 2021. I did a talk about how I ran away and joined the circus and became a mediocre aerialist and how I worked really, really hard to be mediocre at this one thing. Uh, and uh, the thing that I really wanted people to take away from that talk was uh, that you should give yourself permission to be bad at things. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who go into information security and who go into computers uh, were told as children that they were gifted, that they were especially smart, that they were somehow special. And so they uh, don't learn to try hard. They, uh, they don't learn how to really persevere at something that they're not immediately going to be good at because for them, academia is something that they've always been immediately good at. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I spent sort of my mid twenties just kind of throwing myself at things that I was never going to be great at, uh, where I was never going to be the best. And it was both very humbling and also uh, really good for clearing my head. Because when you concentrate 100% on you know, where you are or what you're doing, uh, you can't think about work. So does working out that way, does it help you train your focus? And when you're focused 100%, I feel like that helps you in other parts of like, let's say if you're doing research, like your focus is like on point, like because if you do one mistake, you could really break your neck. Yes, if you are 30 feet up in the air, upside down and spinning, uh, you can't think about anything else 
or you will fall on your head. Uh, and so having a, a hobby in which I absolutely could not just sort of daydream about work and think about whether or not I had finished something or an email that I had sent to someone or scheduling my meetings um, is really helpful. I think that we could all benefit, especially in this time when so much of our lives happen in front of screens from doing something mm -hmm. that involves not looking at a screen every day. Yeah. How has COVID changed things for you? Well, I used to travel mostly internationally about 30% of the year. So I'm not doing any of that. Uh, and I miss conferences, something fierce, and I miss being on a plane. And I don't quite miss airplane food, but I feel like I might get there. Um, I miss the hot towels yeah. and cookies. Uh, I don't miss being jet lagged all the time. And I don't miss just waking up wondering what city I'm in mm -hmm. and uh, what I've promised to talk about. Uh, like five minutes before I have to, the, before I have to like run across town and go do an interview. Uh, I think the, um, and traveling all the time also made it really difficult to do research. Mm -hmm. uh, it is hard to concentrate on the next thing you're doing when you're still doing all of your talk about the last thing that you're doing. Uh, so in that sense, it's been really helpful, uh, to have this sort of calm and grounding time. Uh, but also it's just frustrating to spend all of your time in front of a computer and not to be able to go out and not to be able to, to see the people who make up my community and mean a lot to me. Yeah. For me, I think a lot has changed, right? I moved, I bought a house because I was like, this is, this is the new thing. Like we're going to be here for a long time until these mm -hmm. vaccines come out. Thank God we have it. We're delayed. So I don't know when I'm getting my shots, but I, in my house, I set up like different rooms uh, for different things, just so mm -hmm. I can feel like I'm getting out. Like I have like a meditation room, I have like mm -hmm. the office, and then I have like the pool area. So every place I try to like make a little theme so I could feel like it's, it's different. The lighting is different. And what I found myself is, is doing more research, working, you know, harder, but also reading chillaxing and I still don't watch like a lot of like Netflix. I'm not a big, I'm, I'm a doer. I, I don't like consuming, like watching stuff, but I mean, I try to go out for walks. Thank God. Um, a gym around my house was open throughout the whole thing. They were like, oh, wow. you're just going to stay safe. How about that one? So mm -hmm. it, it was like, it, it's a mixture between a CrossFit and, and a regular gym. And it's, you know, you have your trainer there. So it, it's really good. And that has helped, you know, and, and they limit the people that go in there. But I need that. That's like my outlet. That is like my Friday and Saturday nights. But I get to do that every single day. So for me, a, a lot of things have, have completely changed, right? Now I'm a caregiver, mm -hmm. which I wasn't, you know, pre COVID, but it's like, this is the new norm and you have to be comfortable with, with what's going to happen. Cause you know, 2020, 2021 might be like 2020 where we're, we're still locked down. And, you know, I think in California last week was, I think the first week where they opened everything up, you could dine in yeah. now. So that is pretty cool, but I'm sure if we get that spike, they're going to roll everything back. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping to go to more conferences and, and, you know, one thing is when COVID was happening, we were supposed to go to SAS mm -hmm. in, in Spain and I yes. was looking forward, I booked everything <laughs> and this happened and I'm like, no, I was, I was going to speak at SAS and I was just like, oh my God, I really wanted to go to SAS. And for the people out there that do not know, um, SAS is a Kaspersky conference and it is one of the best conferences that I've been to. I really like the content and, and the people you get to meet and, and the hallway con is the best. It is to this day, the best conference that I've been to. And I think I forged a lot of lifelong relationships during that one year I was there. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I, I miss that. I can't wait until, you know, SAS is, is, is back on and I don't want to do virtual, you know, that, um, not the same. Yeah, it's not the same. So, you know, is there any, uh, conferences that you're doing so people could be aware and watch well, you uh, upcoming talks? 
I don't think that I'm scheduled to, to keynote any hacker conferences right now because mm -hmm. I just did Cactus Con last week. Okay. Uh, so these things are coming. I'm speaking at the World Ethical Forum and uh, ethics forum. Uh, anyway, I, I'm doing a talk uh, with the Cyper Collective uh, in New York next weekend. Uh, so those are, are the kind of next two things that I have coming up next week. Um, but I'm looking forward to, to doing some more keynotes. Yeah. Uh, there, it's a lot harder to do them online because you don't get that immediate feedback mm -hmm. from your audience. Yeah. And for me, talking in front of an audience and talking specifically to them about the things that they care about and they respond to really means a lot to me. You know what? I, I, I want to go into this. It, it was it, It's just off the top of my mind. You're so good at speaking and commanding. Like your stage presence feels larger than life. Like this is what you were born to do. How did you get so good at that? You're just so comfortable up there. I, I cheated. I, um, in, in college, mm -hmm. I, I decided when I went back to school that I was going to do only things that were, that were very scary mm. and that were very difficult. So, uh, I had a fear of heights. So I took up rock climbing and, uh, and then aerial circus arts. I uh, decided that I was just sick of getting A's all the time, so I took up uh, uh, I took up Mandarin Chinese uh, and did two years of Mandarin, all of which has now fallen out of my head because it's deeply embarrassing. But it was the hardest I'd ever worked for a B. Uh, and uh, addition, in addition to that, as a sort of uh, you know after after I was done with all that, I took up competitive public speaking. <laughs> that's why you're so good okay it was that in college or did you yeah, that was in college okay there was, uh yeah they, they do this thing uh which is hilariously called forensics uh where uh the college ha the colleges have speaking teams and they compete against each other and there is a judge who is taking notes who does not want you to succeed uh, and so compared to that, all public speaking uh, that, that I do now professionally is so much easier because yeah. I'm in front of an audience that's rooting for me instead yeah. of an audience that's like rating me. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I watch talks all the time, right? Every year I, I plan at least to watch 30 to 40 talks, right? Mm -hmm. And then for me, I've watched talks for the last 15 16 years, right? Hacker talks. I know people that actually prep. I know people that just like woke up and did slides and did that. And then there are people like you that is like must watch TV. It's like, you know, when you're speaking, it's like, okay, I, I have to watch this because number one, I know you put in the work, right? The research is there and then it's, it's entertaining. So it's kudos to you for doing that. And would you, do you have any recommendations for people out there? You know, I always tell people you should tell your story. You should be speaking because everyone has their story, but to get to the level you're at, I know you took, you said you did what you did to get there, but do you recommend anyone to do anything to get to the level you're at? Um, there are a couple of things that I find really helpful. Uh, the first is that give yourself permission Give yourself permission to to not be good, to stumble, mm. to say um, to not remember where you are or to lose your place in your slides. It's going to happen. The only way that you become a better public speaker is through practice so that when you get up on stage, it is just like being off stage so that you're comfortable and you're you're standing in front of everybody and you're thinking about how you're talking to a friend that you think really needs this information mm. and you connect with your audience. Uh, and unless you're comfortable, the uh, the audience will feel that. The audience smells fear. They they can sense discomfort. Uh, so if you find what makes you uncomfortable and you sort of work against that, uh, you can really make a lot of progress in connecting with your audience. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and giving me your time. I greatly appreciate it. Eva, any last words? Um, well, uh, I think definitely I will, I will go with, you don't need permission to become a security researcher. <laughs> uh, you probably already have the skills. You already uh, know of at least uh, one underserved group whose concerns are, are not being met uh, by existing products. 
And all you really need to do is, is to talk to those people and see, uh, see what's not happening, what research isn't being done, who is not being represented uh, when, when we give these talks and try to give them a voice. I think that that's really important work. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Until next time, have a good one. Thanks.